point. And uh, of course, you've got the lean manager and lead with respect. So welcome, Michael. I want to thank you, first of all, for um, hey, educating us. This is great. Anytime we can get educated by a pro out in the industry doing the work, oh, I, I really appreciate it. So, so welcome. In order to, to be flexible for customers, you can't do it without engaging people. They will come up with the extra effort, energy, creativity, and courage to do so. So this is a radical change of thinking here for, for executives. They have to start Stop thinking that people are the problem because if only they would follow the cookie cutter process everywhere and start seeing that people are the solution and the process is always a problem. The lean core idea is as opposed to Taylorism, Taylorism was about making people work. And Taylor's idea was that people were lazy and would soldier on and loaf. So if you define the process, you'd have them work. Toyota worried about something completely different. They thought as they grew and you saw their growth curve, they will catch big company disease. Big company disease means that you forget about your customers and you start worrying about your processes and systems and structure, and you add on cost and you add on cost and you add on cost. And, and managers refuse to see this because they consider these are exceptional costs. But as in so many cases, let, let, let's just imagine that you start your operation in China, something I've seen many times, and you completely ignore that nothing works and you have to send your engineers every other weekend to China, on, you know, you have to fly them all over the place. So you don't have enough engineers left at home, creates a lot of problems. The engineers are always flying there. The overcosts are enormous. So the whole starting point for lean thinking and for self-development, to break that mentality of the slide of the previous slide, the whole starting point is the realization of these overcosts. And when they start hitting you in the face, you start using these overcosts to discover your own misconceptions. And to my mind, this is what lean thinking is about. The, the first 20 pages of Taishi Ono's first books are about misconceptions. Discovering the mistakes you made that add unnecessary cost to the problem. So to do so, we have a number of practices which are self-development practices. You don't need anybody, you don't need to have a, a, a lean office or you, you just this is, these are things that you do yourself as an executive <laughs> you just have to you know the, the, you practice the practices i mean it's like a you know tai chi um I, 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 I don't know who came up with the sentence you practice your tai chi ono and the first practice of course is you you go to the game but you go to the game but to see facts that they're a source you don't read reports and read numbers. You want to you want to have a real occurrence and you talk to the people. And, and the key thing here is that you get people to agree on a problem before they jump to solutions. Most of the conflict I see in companies are people arguing about solutions when they don't agree with the problems. How, how can they ever agree? Now here's back to the tools, and the tools are very important. The, the tools will not solve any of your problems. Well, the tools are wonderful standardized method to see the problem. So people tend to get this one backwards, but first, you, when you have a, any query, you use a Kaizen tool. You, you go somewhere and, and do it yourself or ask somebody to do this, and you use a tool like 5S or, or, or leveling, and immediately the waste will appear. It will, because it's gonna, because it's gonna, the tool is gonna show the waste which will show the ways to improvement. So you will start seeing the improvement. Um, what people tend to do is the other way around is they want the improvement, they look at the waste, and they want a tool to take the waste out. That, that never works. We have to see this as a self-development. I want to understand my improvement opportunities. In order to do this, I will practice a Kaizen tool. I will discover the mood that I am generating, which will lead me to see the improvement that I can have. So well, that's the first practice. The second practice, uh, to me, and this is what um, distinguishes Lingard from everybody else, is you just calculate that time. And you don't have to be very precise about it. Sometimes it's, it doesn't fit very well. But if you ask yourself, what are, what are the products I'm getting through the same value stream? And what is the tag time? It's this graph that you see here. You have a global tag time, but then you have a tag time for car A, car B, car C. And this immediately dimensions your capacity. Immediately you see the requirements. If, if instead of uh, writing a book, if people ask me, uh, you know, 
uh, how many books do you write by decade or something like that? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, what I'll say is I try to write a book every two to three years. I have a tack time. Immediately, it, 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 it says my, my effort. Immediately, I can see the capacity. And I'm a writer, so I don't only write lean books. I write lots of all stuff. I write a Game by Coach column, which comes every week. I write um, articles that I do about once a month. I do I do other things. I write uh, novels and poetry, all these stuff. And how did it all fills together? Well, through tech time. And through tech time, I can pace my capacity and see what I can do, what I can't do. So tech time is absolutely essential to turn work into physical deliverables that we can understand what we need to do. The third practice is brutal. You go to after sales. Nobody ever takes care of that. The after sales guy are not even in the same building. Nobody ever talks to them. And the first thing, uh, is, uh, this one is actually well, go to after sales and we look at every single customer complaint. Not to solve them. We, we can't. But to understand it, we need to understand the, the, the like, as they told me, the, the, the Toyota guy said, the buds of the problems. The, before the problem must flower, there's a bud of the problem. We need to understand this. And what we discover is that between what customers ask for, what they really use, what we want to do, and what others want us to do, is never the same thing. Completely different things. So, wow, this is a big area. So as we learned in PDCA, one complaint after the other, as we do, you know, how do we fix this? Let's try it, check it, what conclusions? Um, it doesn't solve all the company's problems at all, but as a self-development exercise, it's wonderful. We learn so much about the products. And again, this is what, how we started with the dispensers, and this is where we started, is the, 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 the complaints and the after sales. And again, we're not saying to solve, we don't think that by solving every problem is going to be perfect, not at all. Every problem we'll look at will teach us something about the product. Which brings us immediately to the practice number four, which is you go back to the line, which we did with the dispensers, as you saw, and you start to stop and, and look at every defect. And at first you can, so you put in red bins, you put in breaks in the analysis, uh, uh, control breaks in the flow, and you do all this until you're finally doing this at one piece low. Now, the beauty of one piece flow, and this is one thing as a system, is that if you see one piece, if you produce one piece flow, you can solve problems one at a time because you look at products one at a time. And here, the big thing is uh, you turn it around and it, it all hinges on having a team, a team leader, and looking at every single defect and problem. Again, we don't necessarily know how to fix them all. But we will learn and we will find out. And, and suddenly, um, things that uh, are very complex for engineering are not so complex for operators. I mean, they, 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 they have, at that level, I mean, great insights. And not always right, but great insights, great ideas. And again, we bring production and engineering together. Which brings us to practice five, which is basically pull, 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 pull. Whenever you see a queue, whenever you see an invention, you just don't, don't ask questions, just reduce it by half. Just cut it in half, cut it in half, see what happens. And every time you 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 cut queues and you cut backlogs and you cut inventories, uh, you will you will see problems emerge and you will learn more. Again, this is again, this is not about fixing your production. This is about learning about your process, learning about the policies you have that create these queues. Where do these queues come from? Why do we have inventory? And, and as, as you do this with executive, well, you learn. And sometimes you learn it's tough. I mean, for instance, so it's very frequent that if you have a machining, uh, the guys are quite happy to do SMED to reduce the changeovers, but they hate reducing batch sizes because it would mean that they have less, uh, less first, you know, they, the first part has to be a right part, which is technically more difficult. So all these things, there is not one, one approach. You, you, you cut the inventory, you cut the queues, and you see what you hit, and what you hit is always surprising, and then you work with the guys to fix it. So basically what... Sorry, Michael. Yep. Just a quick question on that one. Um, in a service organization where you have, uh, for instance, processing centers, uh, processing uh, financial transactions or account opening for a bank environment, for instance, 
Um, obviously, inventory is a little bit hidden there, especially if it's inside a system, um, a workflow system. Um, would uh, maybe getting rid of cherry picking in the workflow um, also um, visualize or put some of those uh, problems up in the top? Well, uh, the, the trick is on the slide here is uh, here is here is the the nut, the nut of the problem in terms of self development. How do we teach senior execs to get the hang of Kanban? Uh, Kanban is not just on machine presses. Kanban works with engineering projects, with office environments. Kanban is about visualizing the waiting queue and understanding that on one person's desk, you can have more than, let's say, two, three, maximum four things open at the same time. Kanban is on, it's about visualizing the flow work to make sure that people work on the right thing at the right time. So, so Kanban is not just using Kanban for a, um, steel pressing press. Kanban is, is a knack, is a way to visualize exactly what you're seeing. Take that knack. You have to learn it, you have to learn it, and unfortunately there's a lot of tradition here, so you often have to learn it with a sensei because you, many of these things you don't invent yourself. But the biggest thing in terms of self-development for the executive is to convince them that uh, getting the hang of Kanban themselves uh, will make a difference. And one of the thing, key things you see, uh, which is always surprising, and we saw for many years, people went to Japan or everywhere around the world for suppliers to Toyota. Uh, one thing that was always funny and that astounded us was that the CEOs, and I'm talking CEOs, of a company working for Toyota as a supplier, uh, doing lean for real, would explain to us the Kanban. And one of the things I'm very proud of is that the, the, the CEOs I work with uh, you can go to their plants, you can go to their engineering office, you can go to their factory, to their companies, and they will, will explain the Kanban. The Kanban is what exact, it responds, it visualizes exactly what you're saying, and when the work is hidden in the computer, how to get it out. Uh, and the, looking at it one by one, uh, I guess that's uh, one of the six practices is usually a standardized work. Well, actually, it's, it's, standard, it's not work the same everywhere at all. It's the fact that every operator should have a very smooth flow uh, of movement. It should be very natural. It should be like, like putting, you know, seeding a field. It should be a, a completely smooth flow. And if you look in the office environment, it's crazy because they have these, these screens with these incredibly small lines and they keep going back and forth and back and change the screen. and retype, rework, all these things, and you and you see it, it's even it's even more visual, it's even more striking in a in an office environment. So you have this idea that the person should be able to do the work seamlessly. And you see that. And this is self-development, you learn to see this everywhere. And you learn to see where the person hits the barrier. And then you learn Kaizen, which is as the person, hey guys, you know, what can we do? You just what can we do? We want to work as a sign of again. For instance, one thing people misunderstand 5S a lot, they think it's about cleaning the factory. Not at all. 5S is about giving the operator an autonomous method to reach standardized work. Uh, they will learn to organize themselves, their work areas, and this works perfectly in office because they've been taught 5S so that they can work seamlessly. This is not at all about something you impose to have a clean environment. This is not, a, you know, this is not about taking the picture of the wife and kids away from the desk because it has to be 5S. This is horrible stuff, consultants do. No, 5S is you teach every person to organize themselves in, in, in a way that they can work seamlessly uh, through every task. Which brings us to the seventh practice, which, which is where I, we probably should start with this, which is where it's absolutely wonderful is that when people have suggestions, you learn from this. So the photo here you see is a guy had, they had a very long uh, thing to screw in here, and all they did is that they put a, an attachment to the uh, drill so that you could do it mechanically. This is the level of suggestion we're looking for. But the trick is, as an executive, is you learn from this. You, you pay a lot of attention to this because it's not just to make people feel good about themselves. Uh, recognition is always good, obviously. But there's far more to this because uh, when, when people locally solve an issue, they don't always see the bigger challenge. And, and I've had so many cases where people have solved the bigger, uh, a very small issues and they're pleased with themselves and we re 
reward, recognize all these things. But actually, we walk out of that. We walk out of the room, and, and afterwards, we say, "Oh, wow! Did you see that?" Because as as an executive, the implications could be completely radically different. Now, this is where it gets really fun. So that's the toughest lesson. The toughest lesson is that it has to be inclusive learning. Uh, this is not a cookie cutter approach. This is an organic approach, and that as as you as you your development and their development is the same. You 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 need to develop yourself. You ask questions, people answer, and their answer means that you have different answers as well, and more questions and so on. So so it, it's really the cycle they learn. You learn, and and well, the census from the start they were telling us how to do this. I mean, they say basically this is a, what a guy in the states a to a guy says uh, think deeply, think deeply, always try immediately something. Do small steps, do very small steps, and always start thinking, what's next? Usually, you know, people made an improvement and they're very happy made an improvement, and I think that's it. And, and, and no, you need to, the Kaizen spirit, you need to continue. What's next? What next? What next? So what? What next? So what? And so forth. And the aim of this practice is thinking deep. And this is very disturbing. We act our way into thinking, we don't think our way into acting. Thank you, George, everybody. Bye-bye. Yes, bye. -bye. bye, -bye.